Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the Serenity OS update for December 2020. This will be the last one this year. Uh, so a lot of people have been on vacation this month, so there has been a lot of cool stuff happening in the project. But before we begin, let me tell you about sponsorship. So the Serenity operating system and all of my content about it is always going to be free and open source. But if you would like to support my work and maybe someday make it possible for me to do this full time, uh, then there are three donation options. I'm on GitHub sponsors and Patreon for those interested in making a monthly donation. And I'm also on PayPal if you would like to make a one-time donation. Uh, and of course, a huge thank you to everybody who's already supported me some way um, on these platforms. And uh, welcome to all the new supporters um, added in the last month. Okay, so let's take a look at December. So something really fun that happened was that we got owned again. So um, a year ago, we were in the HXP CTF at... Um, 36C3, and uh, this year um, Serenity was again in the HXP CTF, and uh, this time uh, they had a new challenge, which again was to break into the system, and um, last year six teams managed to break our security, and this year only one team did, so um, seems like we have managed to beef up our security a little bit at least. Um, so. Uh, we saw two exploits come out of that CTF, and we had one from um, YX7, which was a um, race condition in exec that uh, led to a local privilege escalation. And we also saw an exploit from uh, the Alice CTF team, and they exploited an IOPL elevation attack um, or a vulnerability in our ptrace implementation. So. Uh, I'll put links in the description to both of those uh, exploits so that you can read their write-ups, and it was quite interesting. Um, so, and of course, I, I made videos uh, analyzing and, and fixing the exploits as well. Um, and it was really fun to be in the CTF again this year, and I really hope that it becomes a um, yearly Christmas tradition. Um, so, super uh, thanks to... Uh, the HXP CTF team for putting together a Serenity OS based challenge. That's super fun. And um, some security mitigations happened as a result of that. Um, I made it so that we now panic the kernel if uh, any thread manages to elevate its IOPL um, just as a safety precaution. And um, another thing we've done is we also no longer allow you to um, to inspect set UID processes through the uh, proc file system. So they can no longer be accessed, even though it's technically my set UID process, because it is running with elevated privileges, um, you can no longer introspect that process. So that's something, some nice mitigations that have come out of this. Um, so anyway, that's um, the HSP CTF, and then um, since we have System Monitor up, we can talk about, there's a new Interrupt tab here um, that was added by, I want to say Luke, um, and it just allows us to see how many interrupts per hardware device have occurred, so we can see here that my mouse device and System Timer are totally dominating. Uh, <laughs> it's just a little interesting, but let's see. So some new stuff at a system level. Uh, we have a dev file system. So the slash dev directory is now actually generated by the kernel. So this is some work by Liav that I know he's been um, thinking about doing for a long time and it finally actually came together and it works quite nicely. So now uh, the kernel is able to populate the dev directory based on what hardware is available. Previously, it was all hard-coded, so that's very cool. Um, and um, another new thing is that we now have shared libraries in the system. So previously, everything was statically linked, but now if we look at the desktop process here, for example, uh, we can go down and see that um, 
we have all of these different libraries here loaded dynamically. And that is some awesome work by Itamar and Andrew, who put all this thing together. Uh, and it's a huge memory progression because now um, all of the programs that use, for example, the GUI library, they can all um, use the same uh, instance of that library in memory instead of everybody having their own copy. So very, very nice. And we haven't um, fully exploited all of the new possibilities that dynamic linking gives us, but at least the basic functionality is in place and that's, that's really awesome. And um, something else that's new is that we now also generate core dumps if something crashes. And not only that, but uh, we also have a crash reporter that will show up. It detects the presence of core dumps and pops up. And um, this was made by Linus. And it's, it's pretty bare bones still, but it is awesome, I think, uh, that it can actually detect this and give us the backtrace in a graphical way. Previously, you would have to go and look at the sort of the serial console if you wanted to see what crashed, but now this is a huge boost. And I can see here that the, uh, the layout of this window is not quite perfect because I'm running with a larger font than normally. So we need to, to do some stuff here to make it a bit more large font aware. But yeah, this is the crash reporter. And uh, another new system level thing is we now have a mouse settings application where you can tweak the mouse speed um, and the scroll length. So scroll length is basically um, how much do you scroll whenever you move the mouse wheel one tick. Um, and this was added by Edan and the scroll length is a global thing, so that's pretty cool. The mouse speed, um, it doesn't matter here because I'm running inside QMU, so I'm using um, cursor integration, but if you're running with a physical mouse or a hardware mouse, real hardware, um, then it um, can apply a little bit of a boost to your mouse speed, which is cool. Okay, so uh, what's new in general? So in the GUI library, um, I've rewritten the layout system. So uh, it is now based on min and max size constraints. And basically everything should look the same way it did before, but um, the code that sets up the UI is like cut in half. So that's really nice. And um, something that, that drove this was the um, creation of a new GUI markup language that we're calling GML. So GML is a very um, developer-friendly way of creating interfaces uh, in text. So basically you can create them like this. And then we will have a GUI text editor and maybe a GUI status bar at the bottom. Hello. Um, maybe put something in there too. Hello, this is a test. Yeah, so um, basically a new GUI markup language and um, this replaces the earlier JSON-based um, GUI markup with this new stuff. And uh, it is all um, loaded at runtime. So this you can use this very dynamically, uh, which um, opens the door for some interesting future projects. Um, and yeah, so we've been using GML to create some of the new stuff, like the crash reporter program that you saw was made with GML, for example. And it's been just really smooth to work with so far. Um, okay, so yeah, this is GML. Um, and then uh, you'll notice here we have some desktop icons uh, and they are laid out top to bottom. So this is new. Uh, you can now control which way uh, icons flow in a icon view. So previously it was always left to right, but now you can switch it to top to bottom if that's what you like. Um, and 
desktop icons now have context menus. That was done by Zach. So you can actually go here and click on these. And uh, let's see, uh, these link widgets here are new. I, oh, I forget who made those. I think it was Alex who made the link labels. So basically, because this is a sim link to the browser app, you can see here, where does this point to? And um, if you click on it, it takes you there so that you can see the, the target executable. Um, and um, also the little emblem here that we add on the icon uh, is new. So on shortcuts uh, or sim links, really, we put a little arrow to to show you what it is. And um, we have icons and executables now. That's why these things here have icons, actually. So this is just a sim link to uh, Bin Browser, as you could see here. And Bin Browser is just an elf executable. But thanks to some uh, magic trickery, the icon has an, oh, the executable has an icon embedded in it in a special area in the elf. So uh, thank you very much to William for implementing that. I think that turned out super cool. Okay. And some other stuff. Um, let's look at file manager. So in file manager, we have a new breadcrumb bar that allows you to navigate um, the path that you're currently in in a visual way, which um, wasn't really around in the late 90s when sort of the rest of the system's inspiration comes from, but um, I felt like it was a good match for what we're doing here. So I um, introduced a breadcrumb bar widget that you can use and we're using it here. Um, and we also now have a um, there's a shortcut. If you want to create desktop shortcuts, then you can just right click on something and create desktop shortcut. It's pretty neat. That was also added by Alex. So you see here that it automatically gets that little arrow uh, on it. Okay. Um, let's see. So um, maybe, oh, I know what I want to show you. So this morning I made a new widget. Um, for the GUI library, so it's this opacity slider here, because uh, previously we just used a generic slider, but um, I felt like we could do something a bit more fun and maybe a bit more um, like visually intuitive, so I came up with this widget here that allows you to select um, the opacity, and I think it turned out pretty good. And of course we also use that in the pixel paint application if you're editing the opacity of a layer, then uh, it fits right into to that application as well. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to show you in the GML playground that if you want to, there's autocomplete, of course. Uh, if you forget what some widget is called or something like that, uh, or if you forget what the properties are called in that widget, you can, you can get some help with that as well. So autocomplete was added by Ali. Thank you very much, Ali. Makes the <laughs> playground a lot nicer to work with. Um, oh, and something else that's new is a font picker. So previously, you, when you wanted to switch the font, you had to pick out the font from a long list of font names. And now instead we have this picker dialogue where you can choose the family, and then you choose the weight you want, and the size you want, and um, then you can get a new font that way. So it's a, it's a much more visual and kind of user-friendly way to pick out the font you want. Um, I think it turned out pretty good. So that's also new. Some other stuff. Just to, let me just show you some random little things that I, that I care about. So if I select some things here and then I go to another window and you'll notice that the tint um, the icons, it changes based on the window active state. So when the window is inactive, um, then they become kind of grayed out, a little tiny grayish tint, and now they have more of a um, system selection highlight tint. That's a subtle thing, but I, I, I like stuff like that. 
Um, and let me bring up the widget gallery. So um, let's see some stuff here that uh, the disabled spin box here, you can see that it now has proper disabled um, looking arrows. Previously we did not. Same thing with um, a disabled scroll bar now has correct disabled appearance. Previously it just lacked the um, the scrubber, but now it also has disabled looking arrows. So that's pretty neat. Um, and something else is that we now have a cursor animation support. And this is something that Tom implemented and I think it turned out absolutely great. And he also made this super cool hourglass cursor. So thank you, Tom, for this cool feature. It's very, very nice. Um, and what else do we want to look at? I guess we can look at Hack Studio, why don't we? So Hack Studio now is, uh, it used to be based around project files. So you would create a project and then add files to it. Now, instead of that, uh, it's all just based on directories. So uh, you just run Hack Studio on a directory and now you're editing that directory. Um, I think a bunch of people suggested that we take that approach and I think it makes perfect sense and we don't have to deal with um, project file management and stuff like that, but instead um, it's all just a subdirectory, just like just like all projects in practice work that way anyway. So pretty happy with how that turned out. Um, and let's see, then I guess we can look at, actually let me change the font here to something bigger. Um, so let's look at browser. So one thing that is very noticeable if you've been hacking on the browser is that HTTPS is now way, way faster um, than it was before. And that is because uh, I tracked down a bug in the kernel where uh, we would sometimes make a TCP connection uh, and not realize that it was fully established. And then it would take us a while before we noticed uh, and then started sending HTTPS or the HTTP requests. Uh, but now we notice it right away. And because of that, it's much, much faster. So uh, work on the browser has continued. It's been a lot of great work in the JavaScript runtime with um, typed arrays and uh, the arguments object. We have uh, number parsing to and from strings, um, huge advances in that area. Um, and there's been just really good stuff from uh, Stefan, Linus, Luke, and, um, and I also did some stuff. I made the original typed arrays and then Linus made them properly. <laughs> so thank you, Linus. Um, and um, I also did a bunch of work on some CSS features like um, basic support for um, floating boxes, as you can see here. And um, we have had Paul came and did a bunch of work on editing. So now you can do um, this delete should work here, stuff like this, pretty cool. And I think we have basic cursor movement as well. Um, still needs polish, but uh, definitely very interesting. Previously, we didn't have uh, deleting and no cross node interactions. So um, HTML editing, making some advances. Very fun stuff as well. Um, okay, so I think that's everything for the browser this month. So let's see. Something else that was new is uh, Julian made it so that uh, previously we could tile these half um, half screen tiling snap things. Uh, we now also have quarters, I think, if you get it to the corner of the screen. Then it snaps to a quarter like that. That's pretty cool. Um, so thank you, Julian, for doing that. And, uh, oh, oh, I know. Uh, you notice this little geometry label in the middle of the window when I'm moving it around or resizing it? It has a 
little shadow now. <laughs> it's just something I did just for fun. Um, but I think it, it does look a little bit better. Previously, it was just a flat thing. Um, I think it's subtle, but, but nice. Um, at some point, I would like to um, experiment with having a similar uh, shadow effect for Windows, but that will be a bit more work. Um, anyway, so let's see. What else we have? Um, oh, so uh, Eden implemented a search function in the terminal. So we now have find. We can search here for dire. Um, here we go, yes. Directory, as you can see. And if you wrap around, then it totally wraps around. Basic find. So I'm really happy about that because um, it was just a few videos ago. I was looking for something in the terminal manually, like scrolling and looking. So thank you, Idan, very much for adding this. Um, okay. So, oh, something else is that we now have a little network um, adapter status applet up here that Brendan added. Thank you, Brendan. It definitely feels like a nice thing to have. Just It doesn't do much, just tells you what your IP address is, but sometimes that is very handy information. Um, all right. Mm, so other stuff um, in the user space emulator, it's now able to run File Manager and a bunch of other GUI apps thanks to a bunch of people working on it and adding um, syscall implementations. So it was uh, Ben and Brendan added a whole bunch of different syscalls, making the user space emulator a lot more capable. So now it runs many of our GUI apps. Um, I would say they run really well. I mean, they're a bit sluggish, but it's pretty good. So user space emulator, if you're not familiar, is our um, sort of Valgrind application. Uh, it emulates a CPU and then instruments all of the memory accesses so that we can catch um, buffer overflows, use after freeze, things like that. And it didn't complain about anything here, so that's very nice. And it didn't find any leaks either when we exited. Very cool. Uh, and then in the kernel land, um, Tom has been doing a ton of work on stability, uh, performance on uh, concurrency, and um, there has been, one thing I liked in particular was a patch that dramatically reduced our the number of wake-ups that we do in the kernel. So previously we had a timer that would wake us up 1,000 times per second, and now we only wake up 250 times per second instead um, to do process scheduling or thread scheduling, and I think it's a very nice improvement. And um, Luke has been doing a lot of interesting kernel work this month. So um, I think he's been doing um, VirtualBox and VMware compatibility testing. So um, a bunch of good things have come out of that. Uh, we now have support for more intern um, Ethernet adapters from Intel and um, and we now support more than two gigabytes of physical memory. Uh, previously, we would crash in silly ways if you had that. So that's really awesome. And there's just been all these tiny little fixes and things in the kernel that help our stability. And it's really fun to see um, people picking it up and, and caring about it and sort of moving it forward. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really sweet. So another thing, so last month I talked about fuzzing. So we, we um, were integrated in the Google OSS fuzz thing where they do continuous fuzzing of open source projects. And um, now we've been in there for a month, more than a month, and it's been really great. A lot of great bug reports have come out of it and uh, people have been really good at tracking down and fixing these uh, fuzzer reported bugs. So um, Nico, Ben, uh, Peter, Ali, Linus, uh, everybody who worked on fixing fuzzer bugs, thank you. Everybody who added new fuzzers, thank you. Uh, it's been really kick-ass. And I think especially 
our image decoders uh, have been just really great to fuzz because they, they had so many problems and um, they I think we're much better off now that we have added all this good sanity checking to the image decoders. It's very nice. Um, yeah, so I think I think that's everything I wanted to show you. Um, so the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, a fun thing that happened uh, a little over a week ago was that um, a guy named Jonathan Turner made a video where he uh, explores this system for the first time and he sort of gives this live commentary, live reactions as he's uh, having his first impression of Serenity and um, I will put a link to his video in the description. I definitely recommend it. Uh, it was super fun, super interesting to watch uh, his reactions and to see um, to, to see the system through the eyes of somebody using it for the first time. It was really, really interesting and uh, it, it really exposed a lot of interesting areas where we need to um, fix things, we need to polish things. And I've done a whole bunch of um, fixing things up in response to that video, but um, there's a lot more that can be done. So definitely recommend checking that out. It's it's um, I really really liked it. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's that's it. Everything for this month and for this year. So it's been it's been a strange year, but it's been a great year in Serenity OS. So. Uh, thank you so much to everybody who worked on it, who cared about it, took an interest in it. Um, it's been absolutely great, and let's just continue in the next year. If you ever want to talk, you can find us on the Freenode IRC network in the Serenity OS channel. And I guess I'll see you next year. Bye.